Bonjour à toutes et tous et bienvenue sur Cannes Série Live, la plateforme digitale de Cannes Série saison 3, disponible du 9 au 14 octobre, mais aussi à Cannes. So I'd like to start the interview by asking you a very simple question. How did you get into movies? What was your background? I attended Stanford University in the United States and initially I was an economics major, uh, but then I attended a program in the UK, uh, Stanford in Britain, and it was an intensive program in economics and also British film and broadcasting. And that was my first exposure to film and to broadcasting and television. And it was there that I developed a, a deep love of not only um, watching films, uh, studying them, but also conceived of the possible path to a career. I started reading science fiction, fantasy, and horror when I was very young, uh, probably in uh, fourth grade. And I even advised the local library where I was growing up uh, on which books to acquire for their youth section. Amazing. And uh, so, so, and I, and I wrote a, uh, I had a column in the local newspaper where even in middle school and, and high school, I reviewed science fiction, fantasy and, and horror books. Your very first assignment in film was with the legendary producer and director Roger Corman. Can you just tell us a word about how you got to, to meet him? I graduated and in 1977, I started looking for a job and one of my professors Uh, Stephen Kovacs had gone to work for Roger and recommended me for the position of, of Roger's assistant. Um, I flew down for the interview, uh, which was really surprising to me because in 1977, 1978, um, women were generally in positions of little responsibility and authority. And I thought that I would be Roger's assistant for life if I got the job. Um, but he, in that very first interview, asked me what my career path was. A question, to be honest, I hadn't even considered. And I said, it, thinking very quickly, um, I have a degree in economics, I have a degree in communications. Uh, so I said, I, I, I want to be a film producer. And that set my, my path um, from the very beginning, from my very first interview. Uh, he had already started the careers of Jonathan Demme and uh, Francis Coppola, Martin Scorsese. Roger, you did a little bit of everything, which I think is incredibly important, in fact, essential to becoming uh, a producer. Uh, so I worked in his office. Uh, I cast films. I did notes on scripts. Uh, I gave directors notes on their director's cuts. I was in the editing room. Uh, I was the head of marketing, uh, which I was not very good at, I have to admit. Um, But actually the humanoids from the deep experience was something that I pushed very hard for because I didn't want to just be an office player. I wanted to be on set. And, uh, and Roger said, all right, uh, you're going to go from the head of the department, the head of the marketing department to being a production assistant, which is essentially the lowest position on a film set. And that was my credit on, on humanoids from the deep. 
And uh, what really strikes me in these extracts that we watch is not the exploitation side, which is kind of fun. You know, it's uh, monsters from the sea coming to steal women to mate. But the, the, the fun part is the, the inventiveness of the cinematography, of the editing. You can see that the people who made that film liked The Shining, uh, Psycho. Uh, so it feels to me like a Roger Corman experience was like a crazy film school. It was the best film school. First of all, even though you weren't paid very much, you were at least being paid. And you were getting actual experience on set. Um, and the, the people on, on that production, they have all gone on to huge careers. Um, you know, it was a very difficult time for women directors. Yep. And that was another important thing is that even back in 1980, Roger was hiring women um, to direct horror films, to direct slasher films, to direct films that out in mainstream major studios, women would never be considered to direct. Uh, I must add that the, 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 in the extract we watched, the music is by James Honor. It's probably one of his first... It was. It was his, absolutely his first film. It was the first time we collaborated and obviously we went on to collaborate on Aliens, uh, for which he was nominated for an Academy Award. After uh, working on Humanoids in the Deep, I went back to work with Roger Corman in the office. And then my second film uh, was Battle Beyond the Stars with a script by John Sayles. And uh, I was the assistant production manager. And one of my responsibilities was visual effects in the art department. And I went down to the model shop where they were building the spaceship miniatures uh, to see how that was coming along. And a very tall blonde gentleman came and said, why are you here? And I said, Roger sent me to, to see how things are going. He gave me a tour. He explained every one of the, of the models and how he came up with the designs. And, uh, and I of course assumed that, that he was the head of the model shop. That was Jim Cameron. He was not the head of the model shop, <laughs> but very soon, actually he became from building spaceship props on battle beyond the stars he became the art director of the film which could only happen working for roger corman you often mentioned another mentor of yours the producer barbara boyle yes she was the chief operating officer for his company at the time new world pictures and uh previous to that she'd been an attorney um and then the really important thing is that not only did she support other women, she was a co-founder of Women in Film back in the in the 70s. And then she went on to work for Mike Metavoy at Orion. And without that connection, Jim and I would never have gotten the Terminator made. It's really working on those first exploitation films that you realize that you were a producer, that you enjoyed that experience. I really like being a person who rallies the team together um, and is able to partner with the director on their vision and make sure that and make sure that it, it comes together on time, um, on budget, and is a good movie. Um, and so far as that's possible. And it's very important to defend that vision yeah. because I think that good producing is the art of compromise. You're never going to get everything you want. The director's never going to get everything they want. Um, everyone on the cast and crew is going to have to compromise and, uh, and you have to know when to say no, that compromise is going to ruin the project. So uh, after that, in the, in the lapse of uh, six years, five years, four years, you moved from learning your trade and doing small budget movies to changing the history of film and science fiction with The Terminator. Can you tell us where the idea originated? Was it yours? Was it James Cameron? And how you got such a big film made after your beginnings? Well, it wasn't a big film. It cost, uh, not including the bond and the contingency, $5.6 million. Oh. But the largest film I'd worked on at Roger Corman's was $2 million, which was Battle Beyond the Star. So that was almost triple the budget. Um, and Jim and I decided when we were working together on Battle Beyond the Stars that we would each go off and practice and learn our craft separately. So I 
produced a film called um, Smokey Bites the Dust. And Jim directed a film uh, that was the sequel to Piranha, Piranha 2 The Spawning. And he was in post-production in Rome for the producer. He'd gotten very, very sick. And he had a fever dream in which the endoskeleton of the Terminator was emerging from the flames. And essentially that was the seminal image of the Terminator. He called me, we spoke about it and he said, I, I think that there's a great film um, about a cyborg that in which that becomes one of the key images that will be you know, indelible for the viewer. And then the rest of it was essentially putting together the story and the characters um, to reach that moment and then figure out what the conclusion was going to be and, and, and try to make some sort of comment on the world that we em envision for the future. And that's why the nightclub in the film is called Tech Noir because it was a cautionary tale about the dangers of technology. Legendary extract, what a treat to be able to talk about it with you. Um, I chose this because it's a pivotal moment. It's a defining moment for the female character. Uh, she moves from being this independent, uh, uh, nice girl, you know, living with a roommate, with a normal life, to becoming a hero, a leader. Um, how, was it easy to pitch and to make a film with such a strong female protagonist? The, the Quick answer to that is is no, <laughs> which is also um, why the film's called The Terminator. And we had everyone convinced that The Terminator was the lead. And of course, if you know anything about storytelling, the character that changes, the character whose story we're following um, is the lead. So the lead was always Sarah Connor, uh, but we did convince the financiers that, uh, that The Terminator was the lead and uh, <laughs> Once we signed Arnold Schwarzenegger to play the Terminator, we were able to get the film financed. In the screenplay you wrote, or James Cameron wrote, I don't know, her vulnerable quality masks a strength even she doesn't know exists. I think it's true of, of many of the female characters, both in, in Jim's films and in my projects, uh, because what attracts both of us is a similar theme, which is ordinary people thrust into extraordinary circumstances who find the strength within themselves to, to persevere, to succeed, to defeat evil. Um, and, uh, and that's been never more true than in The Terminator and Sarah Connor. Uh, you know, in any writing, in any screenplay, the writers in, in, are inspired by people around them or by themselves. So I wanted to ask you, who is Sarah Connor? Is she Gail Ann Hurd? Is she James Cameron or, or a little bit of both? You know, I, 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 I've never really thought about that question. Um, I think she was emblematic of so many women in the 70s yes. uh, and early 80s. Um, you know, whether it was Gloria Steinem, whether it was, uh, you know, the early women in the farm workers movement. Um, any woman who, who took on the establishment and fought for a cause greater than herself. And that is who Sarah Connor is. She's fighting for a cause that's greater than herself. And we have this preconceived idea about Hollywood that it was like the 70s, very 
political you know years and the 80s with entertainment and blockbusters and i think the terminator is exactly in the in the middle of those two uh, decades you know with very a lot of po politics and a lot of you know a real statement about the future inside the blockbuster the action genre and i think it's important um if you really want to to communicate a message uh if you make it all about the message, you're only going to preach to the choir. You're going to pe preach only to the people who already believe in that message. So mm -hmm. that's why entertainment can reach so many more people when you put the entertainment first and, you know, the message is wrapped within it. The, the, the film was released in 1984, a very emblematic year for, you know, America, for the world. That was the year of the first Macintosh, a year when people believed in technology, in the future, in the machines. And, and your film was a real dark statement about this future. And I think it's just a show to the like Black Mirror is completely a descendant of the Terminator. Uh, how did people react to this uh, vision of the future when the film came out? I think they mostly responded to the, the story, the characters. Um, at its heart, really, it's a love story, um, which I think people forget about. Um, you know, when, when Kyle Reese says to Sarah, you know, I've loved you, I've always loved you, I crossed time for you. Um, at its heart, it's, it's, a, it's a love story. Yes. And um, and I think that um, it's only in retrospect that you think about the concern that Jim and I had even back then about rampant technology. About I mean, it, it, I believe that the that the um, system in the UK about you know military AI is called Skynet. I mean. <laughs> So, so the, the things that we envisioned are no longer fantasies. Yes. Um, you know, hunter killer uh, robots. Um, I mean, we didn't really envision drones, but there are smaller hunter killers that are flying that could easily, if miniaturized, be drones. So I, I, think, that, I think that Jim's vision um, about the future of, of technology and the, and the dangers that they pose to humankind um, are really are really full-fledged now and and you know everyone is hoping for the singularity and yet I always worry about uh, what's when the singularity happens the AI is going to look at the weakest link and the weakest link is going to be homo sapiens the robot apocalypse is set in 2029 so do we have do we really have nine years before? Uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, I hope that there will finally be a similar code among engineers and bioengineers um, and technologists to the Hippocratic Oath that doctors have to take: first, do no harm. And we don't have that yet. And I think that that is very, very important um, that we realize that we now are at the point where we could very well be creating the future that you see in the Terminator series. What kind of cinema did you want to, to make? What kind of projects were you looking for after the Terminator? I think once again, they, they tended to follow the same thematic um, origin, which is extraordinary times in which ordinary people find the strength within themselves to, uh, to inspire, to overcome and um, and to win. And whether that was in a film like Armageddon or, um, you know, or, or even uh, a film that I did with Susan Sarandon um, called Safe Passage about a woman, a mother who believes that because she hasn't really achieved anything um, that her, her voice doesn't matter. And, and that's also not true. I, I think that we can, I think that we can achieve that success in, in many different ways. And one is by being the best mothers that we can be by, um, by working selflessly for others and that there isn't only one path to achieving that 
heroism. Was it easy being a woman producer, a woman of power in the mid uh, 80s? Uh, did you face uh, sexism? Did you have to, 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 to fight to, to, to lead those huge projects? It, it, was, it was very, very difficult. Um, I would be asked questions. Uh, how can a little girl like you produce a big movie like this? Um, when I was making Aliens, the key heads of department in the UK said they wouldn't take orders from a woman and that there must be really a man producing the film and who was that because maybe they could talk with them. And they were really quite shocked when I said, if you have a problem with that, you won't be working on this film. And they didn't work on the film. Hmm. So I, I, I learned early on as a woman in this business, that you had to make a choice. You could be respected or you could be liked. And you couldn't be both. I love you so much, Daddy. I'm so proud of you. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. I know it, baby. But there won't be anything to be scared of soon. Gracie. I want you to know AJ saved us. He did. I want you to tell Chick that I couldn't have done it without him. None of it. I want you to take care of AJ. <laughs> I wish I could be there to walk you down the aisle. But I'll... Get on you from time to time, okay, honey? I love you, Grace. I love you too. Gotta go now, honey. Daddy, no. No, no, Dad, no. It's very difficult to change the belief that um, that somehow certain films are are male oriented. And it's one of the reasons why up until recently, we've seen so few women direct them. Yeah. Uh, I, I, was, I was on a panel not long ago in which one of the questions was, why are there so few women directing the big tentpole Marvel movies? And one of the top agents in town said, it's because they don't want to do them. And I, I said, that is so not true. In fact, I've got two clients of yours who are women who've worked directing The Walking Dead who would yeah. love to do them. Let me sidebar with you afterward and tell you who they are. It's an all consuming industry, the film industry, regardless of, of what position you, uh, you have, whether you're working on the crew or, or you're an actor, or producer, director, and it tends to be a, a pretty small world. Uh, you generally meet people who are in your business, and those are the those are the people that you fall in love with. Um, and uh, and the interesting thing is that, you know, when Jim and I were when we first met and we were making the production of the Terminator, we weren't dating. We started dating in post production. So I think our career followed, you know, meeting, falling in love. And then we made The Abyss when we were divorcing. Can you tell us about Mankiller and how this movie got made and, and, and how you moved from, you know, this, this Hollywood projects to, you know, a completely different economy? Well, the interesting thing is that uh, when I made my first documentary with Valerie, uh, who's Cherokee, uh, it was because I had optioned the rights to a screenplay that was about the Navajo who served as code talkers during World War II. And we went to meet with the code talkers and they looked at us and they said, why are you telling this fictional story? Why don't you tell the real story? And the real story meant making a documentary. At the time, John Woo was making Wind Talker, so there really wasn't room for, for two fictional films based on that story. So Valerie and I were able to get ITVS, Corporation for Public Broadcasting and PBS behind our film and we made our first documentary. The second one was about uh, the Choctaw who created a, a code during World War I. And 
then we were actually approached um, to tell the story of Wilma Mankiller, who was the first woman to be elected principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. And once again, in each of these stories, it's a similar theme. Ordinary people in the first two, these uh, Native American men who were drafted into the Marines, or in many cases, in most cases, volunteered, who used their language to create an unbreakable code that helped us win both wars. And then in the third case, an ordinary woman, a woman uh, who at one point was sleeping in her car because she was homeless um, in Cherokee tribal lands, who seven years later was elected principal chief. Mm. So you, you really can't tell more ordinary people thrust into extraordinary time yes. stories than those. I served from 85 to 87, and then in 1987, I ran for election on my own. It was the very first time I'd ever faced overt sexism. In fact, I think the phrase was, I didn't have a snowball's chance in hell of winning. People would say, the other tribe is going to really laugh at us, put us down because of a woman being our leader. They feared ridicule. They feared being condescended to. Sexism is like racism. It's very dehumanizing. It became very hurtful to campaign. She had death threats. She had people calling her on the phone and calling her names. She had uh, uh, stuff poured in her gas tank. Her tires were slashed. People got me. And the meaner they got, the harder we fought. I had never heard of Wilma Mankiller myself, which was a terrible oversight. And I realized that our history books, our classes in school don't teach anything about Native Americans and certainly not about Native American women. And I thought it was absolutely critical to tell her story as an inspiration, not only for Native Americans, but for all Americans to realize what a powerful leader she was uh, how she was a servant leader and believed that her responsibility was to make the lives of her citizens better in every possible way. And, uh, and every time I watch the film, I have to say, I, I cry. I cry because she was so good at her job. She overcame so much. Um, and she would have been a great president of the United States in my mind. This documentary would not have been made if Valerie and I hadn't crowdfunded it through Kickstarter. Yeah. Uh, so you would think, of course, this is a, an important story. It should be told. It should be, it should be available not only to people in the United States, but the world. And we couldn't raise the money. So, um, so I enlisted my Walking Dead actors and friends, and we raised most of the budget through Kickstarter. So um, that gives you an idea of just how difficult it was not that long ago to tell women's stories. So, um, so it really was a, it was probably outside of the Terminator, the project in which I had to work hardest to get it made. Did you feel that things have changed a lot in the last three years? How do you feel? The catalyst has actually been Black Lives Matter. Yes. Um, me too um, had some significance, but there were a lot of people who were afraid to tell their stories of, you know, of, of discrimination on set, discrimination in companies, um, you know, the casting couch and all of that. And uh, the Black Lives Matter movement has strengthened all people who have been discriminated against, who have um, felt diminished, who felt demoralized, whose stories haven't been told. So I, I think it's really been a game changer yes. for, for people of different genders and, uh, and all minorities. You were awarded in 1998 uh, with the Women in Film Crystal Awards for Outstanding Women who have helped expand the role of women in the entertainment industry. And in, two, in 2013, you received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Arena Film Fe Athena Film Festival. How do you react to those, all those awards? To be honest, the awards have nothing to do with it. You yes. either 
always feel that way. And I don't think an award's going to change who you are. Uh, I've always felt it was important to bring people up, um, especially women, and, um, and to do what I can to tell women's stories, to inspire, encourage, and um, hire women as directors, as writers, as showrunners, um, as heads of department. And, uh, and, and that commitment has been with me for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I was inspired from my early days with Roger Corman. Before we move to the next chapter of the masterclass, which I dedicated to The Walking Dead, which is a huge chapter of you know, the last decade and of your life, obviously, is there anything I forgot to say about you know, those first years in the movies, a movie I, I left out, something you, you wanted to, to talk about that I, that I missed? Um, I guess the, the, the fun film um, of Tremors. Kevin Bacon. Fred Ward. Tremors. And, uh, and once again, telling a non-traditional story, uh, mixing comedy with horror, and, you know, seeing such great actors as Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward um, do something completely outside of, of their, their normal roles. Um, and introducing someone as fantastic as Reba McIntyre. It was just, it was so much fun. And, uh, you know, and, I, and it's, a, it's a great series that continued to, to spawn more and more sequels. And I think it has stood the test of time, even though um, it was the lowest testing film I've ever had when yeah. we did the test marketing. It, it tested in what they call the top two boxes of excellent and very good. I think it's scored a 40. Before we get into uh, the series, can, can you tell, tell us just a little bit more about your job as a producer and executive producer in cinema and television? Is there a difference between those two medias for you? Well, yes, there's a difference between um, directors and their authority, which is much stronger uh, and necessarily so in feature films. It's why, you know, you you have the you have the term that you that you created, auteur, the French term, um, as the is the person who's responsible for the film as the director. Um, yet in television, the producer, the executive producer, especially the person that we call the showrunner, um, is the final authority in the film. So you could say that they in in television, the showrunner is the auteur. Um, so they've crafted the, the, the storyline um, and they, they hire the director. And then after the director turns in their editing, their cut of the, of the episode, the showrunner has final cut. And so that's, that's very different from features where generally if there's a final cut, it's given to the director. Um, so, uh, so there, there is a huge difference. Um, but as, as a producer in both formats, um, I'm very involved in putting the project together in pitching it in bringing on board the, the creative team and making sure that the schedule and budget, um, are kept too. Little girl. I'm a policeman. Little girl. Don't be afraid, okay? Little girl. I had read uh, the comic book series back in um, 
in the 2000s. Uh, I believe it started in either 2003 or 2004, but it was after that. And I thought this would be great for, um, for television, uh, which was something I was interested in pursuing at the time. And I checked on the rights and I was told that Frank Darabont had the rights. And it turns out that uh, Frank Darabont was one of my husband's best friends at the time. And I knew him socially. We'd never worked together. I called him up and he said that I set it up at NBC. Uh, I wrote a script, but it's dead. And, um, and I said, well, you know, let's see if we can resurrect it. And he said, and I don't have the rights anymore. So that next year, we went to Comic-Con and met with Robert Kirkman, who at the time was still living in Kentucky and very rarely in Los Angeles. And, uh, and we talked him into resurrecting the project um, and, uh, and taking it to AMC. And how did the uh, AMC executives react when they saw the lead actor from Love actually killing a little girl, a zombie little well, girl? We, we we actually first had to set up the project because they yes. financed not only the first episode, which, as you say, would be would be the pilot, but they they ordered um, a six episode first season. Um, and uh, I think that uh, what surprised us really was that the home of the home of Mad Men would be interested in an elevated horror genre based on a comic book. But they had a block of programming that was incredibly successful for them called Fear Fest, which were the two weeks leading up to Halloween. And they wanted to launch an elevated genre series during that time. Yes. Um, but, but yes, it was, uh, I have to say, all of us, Frank and myself included, were very surprised that um, that Andy Lincoln, who we only knew from Love Actually, turned out to be the perfect Rick Grimes. Um, yes. but, but his audition, the one that he self-taped and sent to us, and then the one that he did with John Bernthal um, in the car in Frank's garage uh, convinced everybody. How do you work with Robert Kirkman? Because you're doing something very original is that you follow sometimes his storylines and sometimes you digress and you go somewhere else and then you come back to and you invent characters. What was the idea behind that? Well, Robert Kirkman said very early on, uh, this is a different medium. Um, a comic book is panel by panel and uh, you can only tell so much. You can't give m big monologues. Uh, the bubbles aren't large enough. And, uh, you know, and, and, and we, can, we, can, um, we can vary off the page. It is, it is a, a roadmap. It is not, um, it is, it is not the, the script. Um, and from the very beginning, it's impossible to imagine The Walking Dead uh, without a character like Daryl Dixon, played by Norman Reedus, who was never in the comic book. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, in some cases, there were actors um, whose contracts were up, who wanted to move on, who were at that point still alive in the comic book, um, and uh, and then no longer alive in the series. And then there are other characters that we kept alive long past the time that they died in the comic book. And, and how do you work with so many uh, writers and directors? Do you go on set? Do you work from, do you have meetings, staff meetings? How does, how does it work, the creation of a season? Well, every, every year is a little bit different. And now that there are three iterations yes. of The Walking Dead, it's a lot more complicated. At the beginning, it was, it was very easy uh, in the sense, I mean, it's never easy, but uh, it was less complicated because there was one series. Yeah. And... Um, all the executive producers would get together in the writer's room and, you know, talk about the season, talk about where it was going, talk about, um, and talk about it because so many of us come from feature films, yeah. talk about telling a season in three acts, which is the structure of a feature film. Yes. And because after we had our six episode first season, we had a, a split season going forward. Um, we were able to do a premiere episode 
a mid-season finale, a mid-season premiere, and a yeah. season finale. And that really helped that kind of storytelling. I think The Walking Dead was amongst the first TV series that was promoted like a movie with a uh, you know, national release, uh, huge billboards, premieres. As a producer coming from the, the movie industry, the, the, did you import this idea or was it like a very natural evolution? Well, I think one of the key things actually was the partnership between AMC and Fox International Channels yes. to have a global launch. And that was really the, the game changer there, was trying to have all the territories that had acquired The Walking Dead start airing within a very short time period, you know, trying to do it within the first week. Yeah. Um, and, and to support that, um, there was a, a global launch with, with posters and advertising and interviews and it all started from Comic-Con and Comic-Con in San Diego uh, was a launching pad that both Frank and I felt very, um, very committed to because we knew that that's where the big feature films launched. And, yeah. and it wasn't as known for television at the time, but we were able to concentrate the press, not only the US press, but the international press at Comic-Con to have a panel to launch the show. And how did you react to the pandemic in terms of uh, a schedule? You know, the, the pandemic was certainly not in anyone's plans and it's been, it's been a tragedy, obviously, for the people who became ill, the people who died, their families and the world, um, not only our industry, um, but we were unable to complete it because even though it was, uh, it was in post-production, um, we weren't able to complete the post-production on it. And even more so, we were supposed to start filming season 11 in May, yes. and we could not start filming season 11. Um, we were in the middle of production on Fear the Walking Dead when we had to shut down. So, um, so it's, it's given us a lot of time to craft new episodes, to have those episodes written, and to figure out a way to make the productions that start up again in October as safe an environment as possible and give it give fans what we think will be, you know, the best Walking Dead family October ever. So you have these three series uh, coming out together, The Walking Dead, Fear the Walking Dead and World Beyond. Can you tell us a, world, a word about this new series? Yes, yeah, so World Beyond is something that I think is in response to so many questions that we had um, over, the, over the decade about, so what would it be like if you were younger, if you were you know, high school, college age, what would that be like to grow up, to have essentially the, the world that you know best be the world of the zombie apocalypse? Mm -hmm. and, and so that inspired this this take on on the world it's it's obviously part of the world it's part of the walking dead universe but through the lens of a younger cast uh making their way and coming of age in the zombie apocalypse right now a lot of young people who studied film wanted before wanted to go to movies i'm sure now there a lot of them want to go into tv series how do you start in this business for example for you how do you cast a young director, young writer? Well, how do you start getting into this business? Well, we generally don't hire people as their first job. Sure. Um, there have been actually, though, a few of our writers who, um, who started as playwrights. And I think that speaks to the fact that uh, we really focus on the characters' journeys yes. in The Walking Dead. And, uh, and so playwriting is is character driven. Um, and for directors, um, you know, we, we have uh, Liesl Tommy, who is a fantastic South African director um, who, uh, who had directed um, Denai Guerrero's um, Broadway show Eclipse, yeah. um, was actually brought on, and I believe it was if not the first thing she'd ever directed, uh, the second thing for television. And, and what we do to prepare people is we have them shadow our directors. 
So often it's our heroic Greg Nicotero. Um, <laughs> and and they, they follow it from pre-production, production, yeah. and then they come to Los Angeles to observe post-production and what, and what that is like. And, um, and it's been a really successful training program. It's perfect that you talk about Greg Nicotero. I suggest we watch um, a compilation of uh, you know, something the fans of Walking Dead rave about. It's the zombie kills. <laughs> Like you said, The Walking Dead is really about the characters, and, and a lot of episodes have very few interactions with the with the zombies. But there wouldn't be any show, or any threat without a genius makeup artist. And you found the best, you know, Greg Nicotero, who, if I'm not wrong, uh, was a student of Tom Savini, who did the first special effects for George Romero and Night of the Living Dead. Well, actually, his relationship from the very beginning was with Frank. They had worked together many, many times. I'd worked with his company, k and Effects, before on Ang Lee's The Hulk. Oh, yeah. So, um, so I actually had experience with k and and, uh, and he was literally part of, of the creation of the show from the very beginning, because as you so, so vividly point out, there isn't a show without yeah. the zombies. Yes. It may not be about the zombies, yeah. but, uh, but the world of The Walking Dead does not exist without Greg Nicotero and his team of wizards at Can Be Effects, the creations of the zombies. And... Um, and, and literally, that is something that from the very beginning actually determined what cameras we would use. Um, we went and tested what the makeup looked like um, with three different cameras. And that's how we actually chose to shoot the, the series on film. Yes. Because the makeup effects looked best in Super 16, much better than digitally at the time. And, and literally, so that was the thought going into it. Uh, to create a real universe, you have to buy that these zombies exist. Sure. We have to have the best possible actors and extras bringing them to life. We sent them all to zombie school, which, which, um, which Greg teaches. Yes. And, uh, and that way, you, you, know, you, you create a world of, uh, of the zombies that, uh, that is consistent. And, uh, and completely believable, regardless of how far-fetched it might be. We have to, to, to say a word about your relationship with the fans of The Walking Dead, because maybe more than another show, because there's a graphic novel, because it's the zombie world, because Comic-Con is such an important uh, uh, place to, to showcase the, your, your new episodes. Uh, the, the, you have to work constantly with the, the fans. Can you... Can you Say a word about that. Well, I think it starts from the fact that I was a fan from the very beginning myself. Yes. Um, you know, when, when I was in middle school, I was part of a fandom, but we didn't have social media then. We didn't have Comic-Con. And uh, we, still had, we still had groups where we would get together and share our passion for, for, um, for speculative fiction. Yeah. So to me, it was a, a natural extension. Uh, I started going to Comic-Con... Oh, I don't know how many years ago, 20 plus, 25 years ago. And I didn't have anything to sell. <laughs> I was there to worship at the altar of 
these great creators. Yes. And that is the creators, the directors and the comic book writers and the comic book illustrators and um, the, the, the novelists um, and, uh, and the special effects people. So, um, so, so to me, it, it's always been, it's been a part of, of my life and appreciating how important fandom is. And yes. I think it's in, more important now than ever with the pandemic and having all of us feel so separated um, to know that people can, can get together virtually and have gotten together virtually as part of the, the Walking Dead family yeah. for, for 11 years um, has gotten so many of us through very, very difficult times. And it, it brings the world closer together. Some of the Walking Dead finals have been so finale, sorry, have been so traumatic. Uh, I'm thinking about season seven, of course, uh, that I think fans needed uh, closure and needed to, to talk about it. And they were lucky because they had this show called Talking Dead that unfortunately we don't have in France. Can you tell us a word about this show that has been on for nine seasons and 184 episodes? Well, it's, it, it really is. It's something very interesting. And, and the great minds at AMC actually came up with the idea. Um, and initially, you know, the idea was that the maximum amount of time that people would be interested in watching a show where you have people sitting on a sofa talking about what the audience has just seen would be half an hour. And then it turned out <laughs> it wasn't enough. You yes. actually needed an hour to digest it to examine it, to say goodbye through the in memoriam section to people that we've lost and um, to celebrate the victories and, and, um, and commiserate over the grief that we're all sharing together. And it was wonderful not only to have people, whether they're actors on the show or executive producers, um, but also fans, fans of the show, uh, who are, you know, maybe they are in, um, um, maybe they're wrestlers, maybe they're actors or sports figures, um, and to also have a live audience there um, to be able to ask their questions and experience it along with us is was a game changer. And I full credit to, to AMC and Chris Hardwick. The power of the Walking Dead family, um, you know, every other week I have, there's a Zoom call that I participate on, which brings, you know, people who've worked on the show, actors together. And, um, and it really has become a part of my life, not just my work life, but my personal life. And those friendships will never fade. And, and one that, that really resonates with me to this day is the, the loss of Scott Wilson, who played Herschel Green and um, how the character of Herschel has so much resonance for me as a person and the loss of Scott Wilson, who I can't imagine anyone else bringing that character to life, um, you know, has made the world of The Walking Dead. Um, you know, um, he illuminated with the contributions that he made and his loss is still felt to this day. Many of the films you produced before, like The Terminators or Tremors we were talking about before, had follow-ups follow and sequels. Uh, the Walking Dead is just, it's natural rhythm. It's like every year. Was that a, a kind of a dream come true or something you've always looked for? A show that would, in, in a way, never end? Well, I remember the first time that Frank and I, I uh, met with Robert Kirkman and he said, you know, this... The Walking Dead can't be a feature film because it is about characters on a journey yes. and you need years to tell their story. And there's so many characters that you couldn't tell them all in a, in a feature film. So that was something that I was looking for. I mean, I, I look at feature films as being a sprint. Yes. You know, even if, even if they're, you know, a four or five month shoot, there's a beginning, a middle, and the end. And then maybe there's a sequel in the future, but you can't count on it. With, with The Walking Dead, it's a marathon. Yes, it's a marathon yes. because of, of the, the fact that 12 months of the year, something is going on, whether it is crafting the new season in the, in the creating the stories um, or post-production. 
And there's there's been rumors of a Walking Dead movie for many many years. Is this can you confirm this this rumors? Is there a movie coming out soon? Well, there is. A, there's a script that yes. is being worked on, uh, and it's for Universal Pictures. Great. So we we are very eager to bring uh, to bring Rick Grimes, um, Andy Lincoln back, uh, and uh, and we're very hopeful. So this is the character of Michonne, who in the beginning of the series was a survivor, something living the wildlife, surrounded with zombies in chains, and she just, she almost didn't talk and we didn't know anything about her. Ten years later or nine years later, this is season nine, she's become a mother, a teacher and a leader, but also she is still a fighter. Well, I think having fully uh, rounded characters, um, it, it's been common in the past, I think, for male characters. Yeah. I think it's been less common for women. I think that um, actresses have often had to play one thing yes. um, and, uh, and not change. Mm. Um, and often it's had to be within the traditional expectations socioculturally of, of what women do. Um, and, and with The Walking Dead and, and full credit to Robert Kirkman mm. for, uh, for starting it all off. It's a diverse, multicultural world in which there are women leaders, there are women warriors, um, but they're not just that one thing. Yes. And I can't imagine a better actress to pull that off than Denai Guerrero. Of course, and in a way, her character has the opposite arc of Sarah Connor, who starts as a, you know, as a friend and a, someone normal and becomes a hero and a fighter. Michonne has to learn how to, you know, be both. The interesting thing is, you know, if you look at her earlier backstory, she was a mother, she was a wife, she was a lawyer, yeah. and she had all of those things ripped from her in, in a very traumatic way. And, um, and she found a way to survive. Yeah. So she didn't give up. Um, and while I would say it was a non-traditional way to survive by going out on her, uh, on her own, you know, with a katana, and, yep. uh, and two pet zombies whose jaws have been removed. <laughs> um, she still believed in survival. Yeah. And, um, and she, saved, she saved Andrea yeah. and she didn't have to. And I think that was her first step toward finding her humanity again. Seeing Sarah Connor, Wilma Mankiller, Michonne, we can really see in your filmography like uh, different sides of maybe one hero or, you know, a lot of, you know, resemblances, which, you know, if, if we go through French standards would make you an author. Well, as I said, I mean, I think I think I am most powerfully driven by telling the same thematic yeah. story over and over again, ordinary people thrust into extraordinary times. And and as a woman myself, the, the story I most like to tell is of women in those situations. And, um, you know, let's hope that I get to keep doing it for another 50 years. The Walking Dead has a Lord of the Flies quality where people have to build up civilization again uh, and always question democracy, uh, the threat of total totalitarianism. Uh, how, how, how do you think it, it fit into, you know, America and the, and the changes of America in the last 10 years? Well, I think that, uh, I think that once again, Robert Kirkman was prescient 
yes. in creating the different iterations of what society and civilization could be like after some sort of apocalypse. And, you know, and, and if you look at the various signs of fascism, yes. um, you'll find that it's not just America that's facing um, the possible, you know, path toward fascism and totalitarianism. And shows like The Walking Dead, I think, demonstrate how easy it is to fall under the sway of charismatic leaders, of people who say that they'll keep you protected, they'll keep you safe, that the world outside is a dangerous one. Um, and, um, and the rise of natural nationalism and populism um, and the idea of you know, going back to being very insular nations uh, is, is a threat not only to the United States, but to the world. You have a very important uh, election in about a month. Are you worried? I think the important thing is, is to do what you think is right. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important to exercise our right to vote, however difficult that is being made right now, which I think is a, a travesty because the hallmark of a democracy is the right of the citizens to elect their leaders. Um, and that should be made as easy as possible, not as difficult as possible. In season nine, there is a, a fair, there's a celebration. And one of the first things the characters do is uh, set up a movie projection, like uh, you know, so something that really put, brings people together, but also in a way, something from the past. Are you hopeful for the future of you know, cinema? We know that it's hard to go into movies during the pandemic. Uh, do you think that you know, streaming is gonna be everything? Uh, how do you feel about that? I think that there will always be a way to get together and, and view, view cinema. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's part of what we enjoy as humans. It's, it's why I think, as you point out at that fair, that was something that everyone was looking forward to. Yeah. Um, I know that my daughter and her friends have embraced something that I grew up with, uh, drive-ins. Drive-ins yes. oh. are back. I'm thrilled. I love them. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and people are eager to go back to the movies. And I, I just think we need to do so safely um, and, uh, and not give up on it. Thank you. And I'm very much looking forward to continuing the festival and, uh, and being able to celebrate great television. Merci à toutes et à tous d'avoir suivi cette séance sur Cannes Série Live. Et n'oubliez pas que vous pouvez également retrouver sur la plateforme chaque jour de nouveaux rendez-vous et de nouvelles séries. Bon festival et à bientôt.